All right, I think we had a little bit of a false start, but let's try this again. Uh, first of all, happy Friday. And it is a certified sommelier and author of The Glamorous Gourmet, Stephanie Miskew, here with you live from stormy South Florida on this fabulous Friday, July 21st. I think, I, well, I hope the uh, weather doesn't affect our live broadcast, as I think it, it just might have on our first false start. But fingers crossed that we can get through the rest of this and talk about some fabulous wines today. Uh, as you know, if, you're, um, if you joined us before, I'm here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live to talk about my favorite weekly wine picks. So I hope you can join us. We've been having a lot of fun so far. This is, an, oh, good, thumbs up. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much, Oscar. I'm so glad you're there. I don't know what happens sometimes. It just cuts out. So uh, it looks like we're doing so far so good. So we'll just move forward. But um, I love to do these on a Friday, though, because I mean, what better way to kick off your weekend if you're watching from work or wherever you are on your way home, you just swing by the wine store, pick up some fabulous wines, and then you're good to go for the rest of the weekend. So that's my intention in doing them on Friday. So so get comfy and hold on while I just pull this up on my computer here. And if you are joining us uh, while you're there, please leave me a comment and tell me where you're watching from. <clears throat> for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, but give me a minute here. hasn't shown up yet. So in any event, today we're going to be talking about some really fun wines from Argentina. It's such an exciting wine region. I think you're really going to like these wines. Let me see. Pull this up. Come on, Facebook Live. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Got it. It's a little bit of a delay for those of you. And again, this is only my fourth one. So the learning curve has been a little steep, but I'm telling you, it, it's really been fascinating learning about all this. All right. Yay, Oscar, there you are. Great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. So a little bit about our format today, uh, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. First of all, I talk a little bit about the region that we're highlighting, again, which today is Argentina. Then I introduce our four different wines. Usually every time I have four wines to show you. I taste through each wine kind of with you at any time. Feel free to you know, ask questions or leave comments, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. So that's part of what makes this so fun. I love the interactive nature of this. Like Oscar, who's joining us today, I used to, I met him years ago uh, teaching classes down at the Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale. And again, it's just so great to see you back. I so appreciate it. Um, also, I usually keep it to about 20 to 30 minutes. So not too long, but of course, if we go longer, if you have questions, that's fine. I'm happy to stay here with you as long as, well, almost as long as it takes, um, but we'll see. But please don't let that stop you from asking any questions. Also, very important, if you happen to be watching this after the live broadcast, please, by all means, jump in with your comments and questions. I monitor all these videos for weeks and weeks after the initial broadcast. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or I'd love to see any comments you have about any of the wines. So just because you're not watching it live doesn't mean you can't comment or anything like that. In fact, I encourage you to. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, and if you have questions, I'd love to answer them. So in any event, let's see. Oh, I think, do we, if you're watching, can you leave me a little comment in the section below and let me know where you're watching from and... Well, I guess I can see your name, but in any event, I'll let you do that in your own time. So today's topic, my friends, again, is Argentina. Need to issue the purple teeth alert because if you are tasting wines from Argentina, my friends, your teeth are going to turn purple. It's primarily a red wine region. In fact, when I was just tasting through our wines, I had to do a quick brush because it really does, you know, those inky Malbecs really you know, really stain your teeth, but they're so delicious, which makes it incredibly worth it. You also don't ever want to wear white to a, uh, a Argentina or a wine tasting featuring wines from Argentina because, again, it's primarily red and you don't want to end up with any of it on your white blouse. It's just, just a fashion tip. 
But, oh, let's see. Oh, what are you drinking? Schroeder, Est Schroeder Estate Malbec 2015 from Patagonia. Way to go. I love it, Oscar. Fabulous day off, so not in the office like last Friday where partaking of the grape would have been career limiting. <laughs> See, I think your bosses will understand on Friday if you tell them about this. Just bring an extra glass so they can join us. And I just don't see why they'd have a problem with that. <laughs> just kidding. Thanks so much, Oscar. I love it. That sounds delicious. And if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free to whenever you, whenever you feel like it. So again, um, today I'm going to be featuring four of my favorite wines from Argentina. Argentina is the fifth, well, the data is kind of between the fifth and the eighth largest wine producing country in the world. Uh, it is a source of tremendous value wines, which is why I'm so excited to share these wines today. I mean, you can just get tremendous wines for not, not a lot of money, which is a very good thing. They're also perfect for enjoying over the summer. You know, they're not so expensive. You have to worry about them. If you're having a party, stock up on these beautiful wines and you'll be set. You'll be good to go. As I mentioned, prime red wine country, Malbec is a signature red grape. But Tarantes is the signature white grape. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Tarantes grape, but we're going to get into that in a little bit. If you have, let me know. I'd love to hear about it, but it's just a delightful, delightful white grape to be sure. Um, <clears throat> in Argentina, Mendoza is the most important region. Two, over two-thirds of the country's entire wine production happens here, so it's a very important region. And what makes Argentina unique? Primarily, it's its proximity to the Andes Mountains. Uh, this region has mo the highest number of, wine, of vineyards at altitude of pretty much any wine-growing region in the world. Uh, they're mostly located between 2,000 to 3,600 feet above sea level, which is pretty high. And But altitude is very important. And whether you're talking about Mendoza or Argentina as a whole or even California, sometimes mountain fruit is a good thing because when you have you grow those grapes at altitude, it allows the sun to ripen them perfectly, but then at night they cool down, so the ripening stops, which allows the grapes to retain their acidity, which is the key to producing beautiful wines. If you're growing all of your grapes on the valley floor, they get too hot and they produce wines that are just like jammy and fruity with no structure to them. So that's why uh, growing grapes at altitude is a good thing. Uh, let's see, it has a continental climate, semi-arid climate, uh, rather dry uh, with primarily alluvial soil. And the beautiful mountain rivers and the water from the melting glaciers provides uh, all of the water for the vineyards, which is which is a good thing. So they're really set up to make some great wines. In fact, over the next few years, I bet we're gonna be discovering even more wonderful wine, wonderful wines from Argentina. So in the late 1880s, uh, a massive, and this explains where some of the grapes are from, in the late 1880s, a massive immigration happened from Southern Europe. Then they all came over to Argentina. By 1910, 80% of the vines in the vineyard were uh, French stock primarily Malbec. So yeah, so Malbec originally came from France, and we'll talk about that a little more as we uh, sample that wine. It's also a super user-friendly region too. If you're used to drinking California wines like many of us are, uh, you can look at these labels. They list the grape right on the label. The labels are very similar to what we see here in the States, which contrasts with France and other old world wine regions that put the region on the label, which can be a little confusing. So super user-friendly, great value. So why wouldn't you want to sample some wines from Argentina? So I don't know. Has anyone ever been there? Anyone watching ever had the chance to visit Argentina? Oh, I see a little heart. Thank you for that. Love to see the hearts and the thumbs up. I appreciate it, so keep them coming. Let me just check to see if we have Owen oh, LOL. Thank you, Oscar. You can come to Weekly Wine Picks any day. I love to see you here, so thank you for joining us. Um, let's see. All right, so if no one has anything to add, let's jump into our tasting. Why not, right? So first and foremost, as I promised, 
And again, let's see if there's anybody new. I think we're good though. All right, so our first wine, it goes out to all you white wine lovers out there, and it is the Crios de Susana Balbo Torantes from the Salta region of Argentina, which is located in the north part of the country. 2016 vintage. Let me show you this awesome bottle. Let me see. I figured out how to do this last week. If I flip, you can actually read the bottle. And isn't that just a beautiful bottle? I love it. Creos is the name of the wine. And then Toronto, you see the grape there, 2016 vintage. Just a beautiful bottle. It looks like summer. Uh, okay, so then... Uh, Susana Balbo, who's the winemaker, is pretty much a rock star in Argentina. She was born there of, um, she comes from an Italian immigrant family, born in Argentina, started drinking wine as a child, like some of us did, uh, and basically she went on to get her enology degree and became the first female winemaker in Argentina. So she's just amazing. She has her own wineries, but she also, um, consults with many others. And her first job actually was, uh, she was tasked with the process of really developing the Torontes grape. So she's known as the queen of Torontes. Not a bad title, huh? <laughs> How do you get that title? No, anyway, obviously you put in the work, but in any event, so who better to sample a Torontes from than Susanna Balbo? Um, again, as I said, Torontes is a white grape native to Argentina. Produce, it's known for producing very light, crisp, dry, very aromatic wine. So it's very beautiful in that sense. It always has lovely aromas, which are usually followed with delicious flavors. And if, in fact, if you like, if you're a fan of Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio or unoaked Chardonnay, I think you're really going to like this wine. Uh, it's, this wine is 100% Tarantes. It is entirely grown, the vineyards are grown at 1,700 feet in elevation. And again, this wine is stainless steel fermented. And what does that mean? You've got stainless steel on one end and you've got oak on the other end. And stainless steel, when you hear that used in, in reference to a wine, it means the wine is crisp, fresh, and fruity, as opposed to oak, which you, which imparts more spicy, toasty aromas to wine, and it gives her a heavier mouth feel. Like if uh, stainless steel produces wines that have lots of uh, green apple, then oak produces wines that have more spiced baked apple. So I think of oaked wines as more uh, winter wines, colder weather wines, and stainless steel wines are perfect for summer because they're, they're just very refreshing and they don't you know, they don't make you hotter and, and, and they pair so brilliantly with a lot of the food too, like shellfish and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and sample this wine. All right, for time, we're good. Um, I like to use the five S's of tasting when I taste wine. Um, so first we start out with C and that's simply looking at the wine as you might imagine. Uh, there's so much you can tell about a wine by looking at it. I'm gonna show you this wine, I hope you can see it. It's just a very pale lemon yellow color. It looks, there's no browning. It looks young and fresh and delicious. I definitely want to drink it. If it had any browning around the edges, I might suspect it had been oxidized or it, you know, it might be very old, but we know it's a 2016, so it's good to go. So let's go ahead. Oh my gosh, that's just beautiful. On the nose, it's uh, it's known for having that beautiful floral component, which it has, lime blossom, citrus, grapefruit, um, white peach, but oh, that's just lovely. So then, so we have C, swirl, sniff, and next is sip. So I will be trying it now. And because it's Friday, I'm not spitting, I'm savoring. So, which is the final S. So yeah, on the palate, you get the same thing, essentially that those beautiful floral notes, the lime, it's very limey, but there's also that grapefruit and white peach that's just d delightful. And also that mouthwatering acidity that just makes you crave uh, some kind of food to pair with it. I would pair this with uh, shellfish, oysters, uh, grilled shrimp, light white fish, anything along those lines. It's just, that's, that's a really lovely, lovely wine. And definitely exhibits all the qualities we would expect from a Tarantes. Mm. I had to go back for seconds. 
So in any event, that is our beautiful little, and again, it has a beautiful, nice finish. And whenever you're trying white wines this summer, when they light up the sides of your tongue, that is acidity. That's basically, you can tell a wine is high acid when it does that. So, and it generally, whether it's white or red, indicates that the wine is perfect for pairing with food. So anyway, that's our first wine. Again, has anyone ever tried Tarantes, if anyone's out there? Anyone? Anyone? Well, if you watch this after the fact, let me know. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if you are watching this after the live broadcast, please go ahead and leave comments or I'll leave questions. I'd be happy to answer them for you. So, all right, so let's move along to wine number two. I actually flipped the order of our second and third wines. Uh, I wanted to start with Malbec, but our Malbec is so big and bold and beautiful that I thought it would be doing it a disservice. So uh, next is our second wine. It is the Bodegas Nieto Senatiner Bonarda from Mendoza. It's a 2012 vintage, $16 a bottle. Again, fabulous value. And like our Tarantes before it, screw cap. I'm a huge fan of screw cap wines, especially in the summer. Whenever you come across a wine with a screw cap, generally speaking, you're, these wines should be drank right away. They're usually fresh and fruity. They won't generally improve with age, so drink them. They're great, again, they're great summer wines. And oh, and this is our label. Let me see if I can flip this. There we go. Nieto Senatiner. Again, Bonarda is the grape. And it is a 2012 vintage and nice gold label there. Do any of you, um, how big a factor is a label when you're purchasing a wine? Are any of you influenced by the label at all? If so, let me know. I always like to ask stuff like that when consumers are, you know, you're looking for a wine or you might be looking at a region you're not familiar with. Do you ever look at that wine label and, and think, hmm, I like that one and that's the one you get? If so, tell me about it. So again, so let's, let's see, let's see. So, okay, let me talk a little bit about Bonarda before we jump into the tasting of it. It looks so good. Bonarda is actually a red Italian grape variety, which is now the second most widely planted red grape, uh, second only to Malbec. And the two have one thing in common, they both produce wines with very dense color, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Bonarda is a lighter bodied, less tannic grape. So the wines it produces are gonna be more medium bodied, whereas Malbec produces you know, those full bodied, like luscious, fabulous reds. So if you're a fan of say Pinot Noir or Barbera or lighter reds, then you'd probably wanna go with this wine over maybe a Malbec. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it originally came from Italy. Let's see. Oh, and but if you are drinking Bonarda from very old vines, in those cases, it can produce very rich tannic wines. So, you know, but if they are from old vines, you'll generally see that on the label. So, again, the wine in our glass, the Nieto Senatiner Bonarda, is 100% Bonarda from 39 year old vines that are all from the Lujan de Cuyo which is a very important region. It was the first appellation established in Argentina. And it spent six months aging in French oak before being bottled. Let me show you the color. You can see this wine is more, is reddish in color. You can see that it's like a beautiful garnet. I would definitely say it's red and not purple, but it's got a very dense color. There's no way I can read through this. Uh, but again, it looks fresh, it looks delicious. So let's go ahead and give it a smell. And it smells just like we would expect a Bonarda to smell beautiful. It's known for beautiful notes of red fruit, cherry, macerated strawberry, which is gen absolutely what I'm getting in this wine. Also like pomegranate and cranberry, it has a little bit of those notes as well. Um, I definitely wanna try it, I know just from smelling it, so cheers. Yes, and on the palate, you get those same flavors of, yeah, that strawberry, dark cherry, spice from the oak, but not overly so. It's very balanced. Ooh, that's delicious. And that, 
lights up my palette too. That definitely has some nice acidity and very supple tannins. The tannins aren't stripping all the moisture out of your mouth. And that's an important distinction. If the wine lights up your taste buds, that's acidity. If you feel like it strips the water out of your mouth, those are tannins and they're different. Let's see, we have a question. Oh, when choosing wines off a retail shelf, tend to Google reviews if a label looks interesting. Good. So you don't, it catches your eyes, but you don't base your whole decision on it. That's awesome, Oscar. That's great advice, too. And I, I bet the winemakers would love to hear that, too. But I will on your recommendation. Thank you. Awesome. Let's see. Do you have a favorite wine app to help us choose off the shelf at Total Wine, BevMo, or even Costco? You know what? That is a good question. And while I'm not a huge fan of points or all that, I will say Wine Spectator has a great app that can help you with that, as does Delectable. I prefer Delectable over Vivino just based on my own experience. Vivino is probably a good one too. But Delectable, there has a lot of, they made a real effort when they launched to reach out to sommeliers. So, if you have any sommeliers in New York City, California, wherever, or here in Florida, you can reach out to us on the Delectable app about questions and stuff like that, and we'd be happy to get back to you. I just appreciated that they did that in the in the beginning to kind of make sure that, you know, a lot of the sommeliers were on board and, and they wanted their input, so maybe that's why I'm a little biased towards them. But, um, but yeah, and Wine Spectator has a wonderful app as well. I think you might have to pay for it, but, it's worth it, it's a good one. So that would be my advice on that. Great question, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Did I miss anything? Gotcha, okay. All right, so where were we? All right, so on the palette, yeah, all that beautiful strawberry, cranberry, pomegranate, the supple tannins, the medium body. This, it's funny, I know the grape, um, yeah, it, it pairs beautifully. The immediate thing I think about is Italian food. And that's actually what they recommend, a tagliatelle with bolognese or a ravioli. That that would just be a delicious pairing. Let me try it again to be sure. Yeah, but definitely your red fruit. Uh, red fruit and it's, it's just delicious. That's a good one. So Bonarda is the name of that grape. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now... Let's move on. Any questions so far? Again, at any point, just feel free to uh, ask questions in the comment section below and I will check them and make sure to answer them, whether it's during the live broadcast here or you're watching it after the fact because I post the recording and I monitor those comments sec the comment section for weeks and weeks. So no worries. Okay, so our next wine is, I'm going to pour a lot of this in the glass so you can can get the color is the Alta Vista Premium Malbec from Mendoza 2012 vintage $18 a bottle let's see oh but there is the bottle my friends I make it backwards so I can't it's a beautiful bottle Alta Vista Premium Malbec 2012 uh, this wine 14.5% alcohol the Bernarda was 14% so not too far off in that way oops flip it back awesome okay so <clears throat> Alta Vista is a French owned a French family owned winery that focuses on producing high altitude wines which is very easy to do in in Argentina but they're based in France but they were just very inspired by it by the terroir in in Argentina and they're very dedicated to producing wines that are very reflective of the terroir and let's see, it doesn't sound like you use an aerator. Oh, that's a good question. Doesn't sound, Oscar asks, it doesn't sound like I use an aerator. Am I not a fan of them? I am a fan of them in the right situation. I don't run to them first. When, whenever I'm trying a wine for the first time, even if I anticipate that the wine is gonna have a lot of tannins, I always try the wine first. I never just decant it without trying it first because oftentimes, especially in an older wine. Be careful with aerators and decanters with older wine because over aerating them can kill them. 
So be very careful. Always taste the wine first. I'm more a fan of aerators and decanters in younger reds. So if you try this wine and it strips that water out of your mouth, by all means, I'm actually a huge fan of the aerator in that case. The Venturi, great invention. So you don't have to decant a whole bottle. You can just pour a glass through the aerator. And it, by infusing the wine with air, it mitigates and lessens those tannins. And it makes the wine actually really delicious. That's a great question, Oscar, especially when you're talking about Malbec from Argentina, which those are big tannic wines. So definitely break out your aerator or decanter if you're gonna commit to the whole bottle. And if you feel like the tannins are too much, just pop it through the aerator and you're all set. But great question, great question. I just err on the side of trying the wine before I jump into the aeration. I know a lot of people do the opposite and I think they lose out on a little bit of, of experiencing the evolution of the wine in your glass. I like that process as long as it's not you know too incredibly tannic, but great question, thank you. Uh, oh, great. First I've ever heard. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you, Oscar. You made my day. Fabulous. All right, so back to our Malbec. Uh, again, oh, we were talking about terroir, and I know that's a term we hear a lot of wine snobs throw around. Oh, the terroir of the wine. Well, here, if you want to study wine, you've got to know about terroir, and here's why. Terroir is basically the concept that blind tasting is based on, the, the sense that a uh, wine from any one specific region can't be produced anywhere else. That's how without any information about the wine, you're able to evaluate this wine and tell someone where it's from. Terroir, so ter terroir is essentially the intersection of grape variety, soil type, and climate, and winemaker influence, and how those things come together to create what's in your glass. And that thing cannot be produced anywhere else in the world because those things are so unique. So that's why you need to know what you need to know about uh, or why you need to know about terroir. So next time you your wine snob friends throw that out there, you'll know what it means. And again, it just means that a wine represents where it's from. People will often say that a wine is a wine of place, which is a high compliment. It means that it reflects the area that it comes from. So that's why you need to know about terroir. But in any event, so let me tell you a little bit about the Malbec grape. Malbec is originally from Bordeaux, France, where it is still today considered one of the five Bordeaux grape varieties. So, but unfortunately over there, it was a little too cold. Malbec didn't really flourish. It played second and third, fifth, fourth, fifth fiddle to the other grapes, like predominantly Cabernet, Sauvignon, and Merlot that could really do well in those climates. So someone imported it to Malbec or to Argentina where it is now the signature grape of Argentina. I kind of like to liken it to, I'm looking for the, the, the best celebrity analogy. I was trying to think of Beyonce and Destiny's Child, but she was always a star. Justin Timberlake, you know, once he left NSYNC, then he really became a star in his own right. So maybe that would be the better analogy. But here Malbec was like the redheaded stepchild. And then it, got uh, exported to Mendoza, and now it's, you know, it's a signature grape. So it's just, it's a nice little success story. So in any event, yeah, so that's my little story about Malbec and how our little grape from France made it in Argentina. But again, so the Malbec grape is known for producing big, bold, full-bodied wines that have oodles of, of ripe, black fruit and lots of tannin. It can be a little muscul muscular is how you would describe it. it. Again, just big and bold. And let's just jump into our Alta Vista because I think this is going to be, this is from 100% estate grown fruit. And let me show you the color if you can see. Relative to our Bernarda, this wine is a lot more purple in color. It's a very dense, inky purple. I wish there was a better way to show you. I need to come up with a way to do that. But in any event, it's very dense purple um, right to the core. It lightens up a little on the edge. There's also, um, you can see the legs. And the legs don't really mean much except for the fact that if you see them very profoundly and they have like a pinkish hue to them, that means the wine is probably higher in alcohol, that it's a bolder wine that you're drinking. Um, <clears throat> so this wine is 100% hand-picked Malbec, aged for 12 months in both French and American oak barrels, and aged for additional three months in the bottle. 
So again, so the color look, it looks young and delicious. And ooh, let's see, does someone else have a question? Who is it? Justin Timberlake. <laughs> I try, I try, you know, I see things as, uh, from my own perspective, but if you can come up with an analogy from your perspective, I'd love to know. So I, I'm throwing that out there. That's just the only one I could think of. So anyway, I love it. If anyone else is joining us, please, by all means, uh, let me know where you're watching from, whether you're watching it li watching us live, I'd love for you to join in, or if you're watching it after the fact. So, all right, so we've looked at this wine, it looks delicious. Let's go ahead and smell. So yeah, again, relative, I'm gonna compare it to the Bernarda. This is ripe black fruit. This is plum, blackberry, cassis, a little bit of spice from the oak, but oh, it just smells like my mouth is watering already. It smells delicious, just like I would expect it to. So let's go ahead and taste. And if my teeth start to turn to purple, tell me, and I'll give them a little. <laughs> but yeah, oh wow, on the palate, that just explodes with like ripe, ripe plum, roasted plum, ripe blackberry, a little bit of blueberry, even that lovely cassis note that I like so much. Um, it also has some spice from the oak and a little, wow, it has a very peppery finish that you can find in a lot of Malbecs as well, but man, that is just a great example. Actually, I have a lot of clients that love this wine. This wine flies off the shelves. <clears throat> Perfect for pairing with grilled, grilled steak or even burgers, something like that, but definitely something bigger with a lot of big flavors and some fat to it. So like, you know, bone-in ribeye would go great with this wine. Uh, grilled beef, lamb, or veal. Is anyone watching a fan of Malbec already? Or are you pretty much learning about it? I know, Oscar, I know you already like it as well. Oh, and let's see, we have another question. Uh, from Oscar, thank you. Stemware, glasses versus punted non-stemware glasses. Okay, I am not a fan of the glasses with no stems. I, I gotta have a stem. I, unless it's a, a super casual setting. Otherwise, your hands are all over the wine glass. They're warming, not only warming it up, but you're usually leaving, <laughs> if you're me, fingerprints all over that the, the glass. And I just feel, especially if you're drinking something chilled, it warms up so fast. I am just not, and even if you want to casually observe the wine, you can't really look at it when it's in your palm. So we don't really, we might own like two glasses that don't have stems, but generally I'm a fan of stemmed glassware. How about you, Oscar? I mean, do you like the, I'm, I'm always open to suggestions, but that's just my own perspective. We generally like, like a stem. But yeah, this is just a gorgeous wine. Again, the Alta Vista Premium Malbec from Mendoza, 2012 vintage. Might not be the current vintage that you find out there, but whatever that is, go ahead and get it. This is just a beautiful, beautiful wine. <clears throat> okay, let me have one more sip. Okay, delicious. Yay. All right, so let's move on to our fourth and final wine of today's tasting. And that is the uh, T-Cal, let me scoot these guys down, let's see. It's the T-Cal Patriota from Mendoza, again, 2012 vintage. This one is a little pricier at, two th or at $25 a bottle. And let me show you this gorgeous bottle. I'd say of most of the wines from South America that I've carried, this one gets probably the most repeat orders. And you see the beautiful label, the beautiful artwork. Again, you can see Patriota, 2011 vintage. It's 60% Malbec, 40% Bonarda. But it is a beautiful wine. And as you might expect, it brings the, the beautiful qualities of both of those grapes and melds them together, which is a very nice thing. So it's always nice to experience the grapes on their own. So then when they're blended, you can kind of see which, eat, which, which qualities each one brings to the party, which is always a little fun. Let me just check. I think we had someone else join us real quick there to the folks at Water for <laughs> Oscar says, I will send a harsh email to the folks at Waterford for making me buy six of them. <laughs> Sorry, and I love Waterford. We have Waterford glasses. Just turn them back in for some ones with stems. I'm just kidding. I'm sure they're fun and, you know, 
in a casual atmosphere, I think they're great. So again, nobody, that's a good thing about, wrong, about wine. Like everyone's palate's different, no one's is wrong, generally speaking. So, okay. So Tikal, the winery, is actually owned by a man by Ernesto Catena. He's a fourth generation winemaker and son of legendary winemaker Nicholas Catena. Um, he has quite a reputation, this Ernesto, as being quite a renaissance man. He's a skilled horseman, fashion designer, software developer, and book editor, and he is all about pursuing passion in life, which thankfully for us is very much reflected in his wines. Um, and especially this line of wines, the Tikal wines are all about, I'm going to read this because I didn't memorize it. These wines are meant to provide enormous pleasure rather than provoke contemplation and are an expression of emotion rather than intellect. So he's named these three wines. There's Patriota, Amorio, and Jubilo. So Patriot, Love Affair, and Rejoice. So we're sampling the Patriot um, wine today. And as I said, it's 60% Malbec, 40% Bernarda from 14-year-old vines. It spent 12 months in French and American oak. And let's have a look, shall we? Let's see. So again, this wine, it's, I'd say it's more red in color, meaning it has more of the color of the, you know what, it's a reddish purple. Who am I kidding? That is a perfect blend of red and purple. It definitely is, it's very inky. There's no way you're seeing through it. And again, the, the legs going down the sides of the glass are very tinged. Ooh, and I'm glad I saw that little piece of cork because this is a very important lesson. When I was opening this wine, this is what happened, my friends. Cork, crumbling cork. A wine lover's worst nightmare. Well, not worst, but no one likes it when you pull the cork and only half of it comes out, but it happens. But it's very important when this does happen, keep going. Don't ever write off a wine based on a crumbling cork. Some people think when the cork crumbles and gets in the wine, that refers, ooh, I like a thumbs up, awesome. Um, some people think when a cork crumbles and gets into the wine, that means a wine is corked, but that is not the case. A corked wine is a wine that's actually um, spoiled by a contamination element in the cork. It's not the cork itself. So oftentimes, even aged wines, sometimes the cork crumbles, even if the cork looks terrible, taste the wine. So, some of the most delicious wines I've ever tasted have had corks that have come apart. So by all means, just get the cork out of there, strain it, you should have a little strainer and a funnel, strain it out and taste it because my friends, the wine itself could be delicious. So that's my lesson to you for the day. Um, <clears throat> so again, yes, I saw my little piece of cork on the side of the glass and it reminded me, um, usually you should strain it, but I just left it in there. So it looks beautiful. Let me see if I, I'm gonna swirl and sniff the second and third S's. Oh, and you know what? This is like a, it's, it's red and black fruit. It's that beautiful macerated strawberry together with the lovely ripe dark plum and blackberry. And again, the spice from the oak. And I'm going to go ahead and sample it. Oh, and the, I mean, that's just delicious. This wine has just flown off the shelves. Whenever I have it in stock, it's gone in two seconds. I don't really sell wine anymore, which is why I'm still working on that retail partner for everybody. But, oh my God. And again, it has a lovely acidity as well. So it's perfect for pairing with food. Um, gosh, again, steaks on the grill, roasted lamb, uh, hamburgers, barbecue. Th this wine would be just fantastic. So it, it really does marry the best qualities of both the Melbeck grape and the Bonarda grape to produce the wine. I'd still say it's full bodied. It's more on the full body side, which it gets from the Malbec, but it, you know, it has more acid and the complexity and depth of flavor is why the wine is more expensive and what kind of sets it apart from the wines before it. Not that there's anything wrong with those wines. They're perfectly enjoyable. I'd recommend, I recommend all of them. That's why they're here today. But again, the Tikal Patriota is just a lovely, lovely wine. Um, let me see if I have, let's see, I have another question. Sounds like he should be the most interesting man in the world for, yeah, <laughs> for wine Mari. He, yeah, he's a character. Absolutely. Absolutely. Paddle blade openers rule for older wines. Butler's best friend brand. Yes. For older wines. Yes. It's, and they make a couple other 
contraptions that if you do open a lot of aged wines, which you, I think you do, Oscar. Yeah, you, you're, I've seen your cellar and it's fabulous. So, and there's a couple other contraptions. Some combine the two, which, and I forget the name of it. I'll, I'll let you know next time or I'll leave it in the comment section below. But yeah, those are great options for, for older wines when those corks are very fragile. But again, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the wine in that bottle. Always, someone was telling me how oh, the corks were, <clears throat> terrible in bad shape so we threw the wine out it was like oh my god don't do that always try the wine so a uh, hard lesson to learn but but better better late than never no that's very important don't want to be throwing out good wine right mm. so all right so that concludes our tasting of four fabulous wines from Argentina today I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed chatting with you, Oscar. I'm so glad we had this time together. And you know, and I loved all your questions. They're awesome. And I really appreciate it. Again, as you're watching this uh, broadcast after the fact, please be sure to leave your comments and questions. I will get back to you. I will answer them. I monitor these videos for weeks after. And it's fun because it kind of makes like a week long conversation, which is which is always fun. No, Oscar, you're fine. Wish your podcast was a radio station ticket giveaway. <laughs> you would, you would, and I'm gonna do more of that in the future. I think you'll probably still win though. So anyway, so thank you so much for joining me today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, your homework, if you choose to accept it, is get pick up a wine uh, you know, from your wine store from Argentina, whether it's a Tarantes, a Bernarda or a Malbec or a blend. Pick up a wine you haven't tried before. And then once you've tried it, come back and comment in the section below this video about what you thought about it. Did you like it? Is it a wine you'll buy again? What did you pair it with? Any comments you have about that wine, I'd love to hear. So that's your homework um, for the week. Also, if you, uh, if you enjoyed today's broadcast or whenever you watch it, please tell your friends and spread the word. I, we love, I love to keep these as interactive as possible. And, you know, especially when it comes to food and wine, the more the merrier. And it's always more fun when you're talking about it with friends. Um, yeah, and I just appreciate you being here. And actually, next Friday, I'm traveling. I'm heading up to the Hamptons to cover the James Beard Foundation's Chefs and Champagne event. So we will not have our tasting uh, next Friday, but I will be back with you again Friday, August 4th, when I'm gonna share uh, some fabulous wines that we discovered on our last trip to California. So these are some of my favorite wineries. You won't wanna miss it. Uh, yeah, they're really delicious and some unique wines and you're just, a that really highlights some unique things they're doing there and just some fabulous examples of some classics that you probably already like. So thank you for the hearts and the, love the hearts and the thumbs up. It means the world to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you again so much for joining me. A special thank you to Oscar and, and anyone else who's watching this again after the fact. So cheers, happy Friday, and I hope you have a fabulous weekend. Cheers. Yeah.